This is going to be Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to see how worldliness ruins Christians. In this first chapter of the book of Daniel, we see how that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, went into Jerusalem and besieged it, meaning he surrounded it with armed forces, and he went in and captured it. He took the inhabitants captive, and this fulfills the prophecy given by Isaiah the prophet, in Isaiah 39, verses 3 through 8. And in this chapter, chapter number 1, I want to go verse by verse, but also give you some truths about how worldliness ruins Christians. And number 1, how does worldliness ruin Christians? It takes you into Satan's territory. If you have read the Bible, then you know that Satan is the God of this world, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. And we're going to get a lot of practical truths from this chapter. We first see that the first verse can picture a backslid, a worldly Christian, being turned over in, into Satan's possession. Jehoiakim, a wicked king, was captured along with other children of Israel. And this reminds me how the man in uh, 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 was turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Because if you stay in your sin, in your idol worship, in your sex perversion, in your pornography, in your drinking of alcohol and living like the devil and living like the world wants to live, then you're going to be eventually turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And when we apply the phrase, there is a sin unto death to this present age, it can be any unconfessed sin that you're not trying to give up or trying to get the victory over. If you continue in that sin, you're going to end up sinning that sin over and over again until you just die. You're going to be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. God is going to remove His protective hand from you. And that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour is going to be unleashed on you. And you're going to see an early death. And now Daniel 1-2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. Notice it was the Lord that gave Jehoiakim into his hand. And this reminds me how God will use the devil as a puppet to chasten a disobedient son. Hebrews 12, 8 says, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Satan is the rod of God, and God is going to whip you with his rod if you continue in your sin. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in his epistle, he said he was going to, live, to deliver Hymenaeus and Alexander unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. What I believe is, I believe we have a hedge built around us by God, and the more we sin and the more we continue disobeying God and being in rebellion as His children, the more we do this, the more God's protective hand will be taken away if we continue in this unconfessed sin. God will unleash that roaring lion who walks about seeking whom He may devour, which is the devil. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to stay in your sin. You can get victory over your sin. We have the Holy Spirit living in us who can lead us into the ways of righteousness. So we don't have to be walking like the children of disobedience like we did before we were saved. The Bible says, What fruit have ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You ought to be ashamed of the wicked things you're doing. And not just keep living like the devil. So Daniel 1 2, it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and part of the vessels of the house of God. And this shows how Satan wants to take away the things of God out of your life. So, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So Nebuchadnezzar carries some things that pertain to the true God and puts them into the treasure house of his God. 
And this reminds me how some men will have Bibles or hymn books or Bible commentaries on the bookshelf next to R-rated movies. Uh, the devil wants to take away the things of God out of your life and put them up on the shelf. If he can get you turned over to him, he can ruin your ministry, he can ruin your testimony, he can ruin your family. Uh, you have eternal security if you're saved, but you can lose everything else except your salvation. And if he's got all the things that pertain to God from your life put up on the shelf, then this way you aren't winning souls and he, you aren't stealing the devil's children away from him anymore. Now Daniel 1 3, it says, And the king spake unto Hashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. And a eunuch is a man who can't have children. You can look up the definition for that if you want to know more about that. It says that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. So if we picture Nebuchadnezzar as the devil, this pictures how Satan wants God's people for his use. The devil can use a Christian by causing them to bring shame to the name of Jesus Christ. When a Christian sins openly in public, it gives the lost world occasion to blaspheme. When a preacher goes out and does something wrong in public, maybe uh, flirting with women at work or cussing at work in front of people, then that gives the lost world occasion to blaspheme. They'll say, what kind of Christian is that? Or I thought he was supposed to be a Christian. Or why would I want to be a Christian when he lives just like I do? You really hurt uh, the cause of Christ and you make the ministry harder for other Christians when you go out into the world and live like the devil. Uh, Daniel 1.4 says, Children in whom was no blemish. Uh, this means they didn't have anything like acne or scars. But applying this to ourselves today, if you're born again, you are without blemish. You have a sinless record because Christ's righteousness has been imputed unto you. Uh, when God sees you in the spiritual sense, He no longer sees your sin. He sees the perfect spotless record of Jesus Christ because the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to your soul. So children in whom was no blemish but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So he wants children who understand science, and these children he gets understand science, but not science falsely so-called. 1 Timothy 6.20 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Evolution or any science that doesn't line up with the Bible is science falsely so called. And these children that he gets are skillful in all wisdom. Uh, this isn't the wisdom of the world as the Bible talks about. If you want the wisdom of the world, then you can get it from Places like Dr. Phil or Oprah or some of these talk shows on TV. Or you can go to a counselor or a psychiatrist. They will give you the wisdom of the world. Because they try to get a person's life back together without helping them spiritually by giving them the gospel and showing them the truth from the scriptures. Uh, you can say a whole lot of good things and tell someone how to be moral and live right but never give them the scriptures. And there is no lasting effect when you don't give the scriptures. But notice the last phrase in Daniel 1 4. It says, Whom they might whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. A worldly Christian will end up talking like the sinful world. Uh, they don't want you speaking your language around them. They want you to cuss. They say, how come you don't cuss? Do you, you think you're better than me? They want you to gossip. They'll try to get you in on talking bad about other co-workers or your classmates. Uh, they want you to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. They hate for you to say, the Bible says this, or I thank the Lord for that, or Lord willing, I'll go and do this or that. 
That kind of talk makes them uncomfortable because the Bible reminds them of their wicked deeds. It puts their darkness into the light. And men hate light because they don't want their darkness to be reproved. A worldly Christian is taken into Satan's territory and he wants you shacked up with the world. He wants you to act just like the sinful world. So if you ever do get right with the Lord ever again, then your testimony has been destroyed. And then they don't take the things that you're saying seriously anymore. They'll say, well, you were just doing this last week, so why are you telling me this? So Nebuchadnezzar wants children with knowledge, meaning they know some things, with wisdom, meaning they know how to use it, and understanding they know why they are doing what they're doing. He wants intelligent men to learn the ways of wickedness instead of using their knowledge for the ways of righteousness. And there are many intelligent, born-again, saved men who are great orators, who go off to Bible college somewhere, and they come back worldly. Someone talks them out of the Word of God. Uh, the professor tells them the Bible has errors in it. And you'll always come out worldly if you use corrupt Bibles. Because the corrupt Bibles come from Alexandria, Egypt. Egypt being a type of the world. Now Daniel 1.5, it says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. If the devil can get you three years at one of these Bible colleges somewhere where he can talk you out of the word of God and make you worldly so you use the new Bibles and then you'll get the new music and then you'll just have not very many standards and you think if somebody's saying, well, I've, I stand for the King James Bible because it's got the deity of Jesus Christ right, it's got the sinlessness of Jesus Christ right, they'll say, well, you're just being nitpicky. You have to be nitpicky about the Word of God. So Daniel 1, five and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. So these children of Israel were going to be able to eat the king's meat and drink the wine that he drank. He was going to provide for them. If you're living your life for the devil for a while... It will pay to serve the devil. He will provide for you. All the stuff you hear about someone selling their soul to Satan is true. He gives you something for it. He will give you something in exchange for worship. Even a Christian, uh, you can't sell your soul to the devil. Uh, he can't take your soul. But you can live for the flesh and the devil will give you something for a short time in exchange for for living for Him. In Luke 4, 7, Satan told Jesus, If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. The Bible says, Ahab sold himself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. You can sell out to the devil for money, for fame, for material items. You see all these celebrities and athletes who for a while are on top of the world and then something happens and they, they hit rock bottom. This is because their contract was up. It paid to serve the devil for a while. But the pleasures of sin only last for a season. If you live for the flesh, the end thereof is, the, is, is death. There is a sin unto death. Daniel 1, five, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. This world desires to keep your appetite on filth. That is why on your news feed, what comes up? A bunch of wicked stuff. On your YouTube, if you're watching wicked videos, what's going to come up? Wicked videos. Uh, on Twitter, on Pinterest, he wants to keep your mind on filth. That's why he puts up wicked advertisements that make you lust. But moving on to our next point, 
Not only does worldliness take the Christian into Satan's territory, it also tarnishes his testimony. In Proverbs 22, 1, it says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Ecclesiastes 7, 1 says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death and the day of one's birth. Once you lose your good name, you can get it back, but there is always that smudge. Like the Bible says, David is a, is a man after God's own heart. But everyone always says, but he did commit adultery and have Uriah killed. Once you lose your good name, you can get it back, but there's always that smudge. People don't always remember you for the good, but they do always remember you for the bad. And this is because they feel bad about themselves, and if they can dig up dirt on someone else, then it makes them feel more spiritual and not as bad about their own pet sins that they have going on in their life. For this reason, you have, an enti you have entire ministries dedicated to exposing the sins of others and naming their names and exposing their false doctrines and downfalls of other Christians. I mean, you need to expose the false doctrine of other Christians, and you have to name names at times. Paul named names, but to dedicate your whole ministry and writing entire books called Such and Such Preacher Exposed and The Truth of Such and Such Preacher to ruin their ministry, that's not how you're supposed to do it. There are men who spend their time writing entire books against a certain preacher to ruin his ministry. Maybe these preachers did do something in their past that did hurt their testimony, and maybe they didn't. But even if they did, if they're living right and trying to serve God now, God has forgiven them, why can't you forgive them? But worldliness tarnishes your testimony or your good name. Uh, Daniel 1, six and 1, seven says, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Each one of these names means something. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah mean something good, while the names the prince of the eunuchs gives them mean something bad. Now these children of Israel are good guys. They haven't done anything wrong. But this does remind me how when a Christian gets out in the world, he ruins his good name. The name Daniel means God is my judge. But when they give him his new name, his new name, Belteshazzar, means Baal protect his life. Baal is a false god or another name for the devil because false gods are Satan ways, Satan's ways to get worship. And Satan is also referred to as Beelzebub. The name Hananiah means Jehovah is gracious. His new name, Shadrach, means decree of the moon god, Allah. And Nebuchadnezzar worships the moon god. The name Mishael means who is what God is. His new name, Meshach, means who is like Aku, a false god. The name Azariah means Jehovah is my keeper. His new name, Abednego, means servant, servant of Nebo or light, which is a false god. This pictures how the world will try to ruin your good name for Jesus Christ. So worldliness takes you into Satan's territory. It tarnishes your testimony. And on number three, it takes away your appetite for truth. If you spend your time out in the world watching the new movies, out of the theaters, the rated R movies, reading the magazines that talk about filthy stuff, uh, playing video games and living in pleasure then the truth, the Word of God, isn't going to come into your mind. That stuff kills your appetite for the truth. You're going to be watching HD movies on a Blu-ray player 
or playing these video games on an Xbox One, uh, you're not going to want to open your Bible and see black, later, black letters on a white page. That stuff kills your appetite for the truth. But now Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to conform and eat the king's meat and drink his wine. In Daniel 1.8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. If you are a born-again Christian, then your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you don't want to defile the temple of God. When you do things out in the world like committing fornication, watching pornography putting things in your body that you're not supposed to, then you're defiling yourself, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost, according to 1 Corinthians 6. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. You need to purpose in your heart that you're not going to live for the flesh. Living for the flesh will take away your appetite for the truth. And you're not going to want to read the Bible if you're constantly sinning. And a smart person once said, this sin will keep you from the Bible, or this Bible will keep you from that sin. Now Daniel didn't want to eat the king's meat because Nebuchadnezzar worshipped the moon god and he knew that the meat had probably been offered to idols. The fact that Daniel didn't eat the king's meat preserved his testimony. He didn't conform to the ways of the world. It also kept his appetite for something better. And you need to get rid of the worldly garbage in your life that is consuming your time and your appetite and get a hold of the things of God. Daniel 1.9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. God will take care of you in the workplace full of lost supervisors and worldly lost people. It says God had brought Daniel into tender into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs if you work hard and live right at work and don't slack off don't take long breaks don't do stuff you're not supposed to then you can win the favor of even a lost supervisor he's going to see all these other workers over here goofing off not doing nothing they're lazy they're coming in late but yet you come in on time and you're doing your work And Daniel 1.10 says, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. So Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah won't eat what the king wants them to eat. And this has the prince of the eunuchs scared to death because he doesn't want the king to take his head off because he's not getting them to do what he wants them to do. And this shows that a person who lives for the devil lives in fear. And a religious person who is not trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation has the fear of man. He's worried about what all the other people in his religion are going to think. He's not worried about what God thinks. You're not free if you're lost and living for the devil. You have the fear of man. You're worried about living up to this certain standard to stay saved. But there's freedom in Christ. The prince of the eunuchs didn't want to become a part of the 27 club or something like that. He didn't want to endanger his head to the king. Because it seems like when someone sells out to Satan, whether it be a celebrity or an athlete or anyone who gets something from Satan in exchange for their living for him or for their soul. It seems like if they prematurely break that contract by coming out with some truth or something to enlighten the people that they have deceived, that person becomes an enemy of the devil and they'll be taken out. And this is what the prince of the eunuchs was worried about. In Daniel 1.11 it says, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink, 
Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So Daniel and the boys chose not to eat the king's meat and the wine which he drank. They ate pulse, something like vegetables, and they drank water. And what they chose to put in made them come out better than what the world wanted them to put in. If they would have put in what the world wanted them to put in, then they would have come out worse. But rather they came out ten times better. And this is so true for today. If you put the things of the world in your mind, then you'll turn out looking like the world. If you put the things of the Bible in your mind, then you'll turn out looking like a Christian is supposed to look. You can't put America's Got Talent and American Idol and The Big Bang Theory and Oprah and Dr. Phil and MTV and BET and iTunes, the top songs on iTunes, in your mind constantly and not come out worldly. We are living in a time full of worldly Christians. They have no idea, they have no discernment. Is this right or is this wrong? Is this country music okay for me to listen to because it says Jesus in it? Or is it wrong to listen to because it also says I'm going to go get drunk? They have no discernment between what's right and wrong. They can't tell that the new versions are wrong and the King James Bible is right. But Psalms 1.1 1, 1 through 1, three says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You can tell what people are putting in their minds and body by their outward appearance many times. And you can see the wicked look on the face of a wicked person. You can see the ways of a, a whore and the way she dresses. You can see what kind of music a person listens to by the way they dress many times. And the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What are you putting in your heart? The things you watch and see and listen to will influence you spiritually. And if you put good in, then you get good out. But Daniel didn't let the world take away his appetite for something good. But not only does worldliness take away your appetite for truth, it also takes over your time and your talents. People are blessed with time and with talent. God can use your talent, and the devil can use your talent. God can use your intelligence and then give you more, and then the devil can use your intelligence and educate you in the ways of wickedness. Daniel 1, 16 and 17 says, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should not drink, and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So God can take your knowledge and skills and strengthen those things when you spend time with Him through Bible reading and fellowship. But the Bible says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. It says, Who hath marked His word and heard it? It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. It says, Give attendance to reading. It says, redeem the time because the days are evil. God can heighten your knowledge, skill, and learning and wisdom. When you study the book and you can learn the ways of righteousness, the devil can take all those things and cause you to get deep into the knowledge of sinful things. The Bible says we should be simple concerning evil. You can be smart in the ways of wickedness. You can learn how to hotwire a car how to kill without being caught, how to sneak around and get into mischief. You can spend all your time learning how to correct the Bible instead of study the Bible. 
The devil and this world will take over your time and your talents. And Daniel and the three other boys didn't let this happen. In Daniel 1, 18 through 21, it says, Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought, brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So these magicians and astrologers could have been used of God if they chose God, but they chose the devil and never amounted to what they could have. None of the magicians or the astrologers were anywhere close to as good as Daniel. And none of the magicians in the Bible ever compare to God's men. For one reason, it's a forbidden practice. In Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, where it says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. Magicians and astrologers are involved in forbidden practices. They are trying to have godlike power without God. Remember how Moses could do all the tricks with his rod, and he had the power of God on him. The magicians Janus and Jambres could copy some of these tricks by using the satanic powers that they had. But they couldn't compare to the power Moses had that he got from God. And in Exodus 8.18 it says they couldn't bring forth lice. But Moses could. They are inferior in power. And in Genesis 41.8 none of the magicians could interpret Pharaoh's dream. Yet Joseph could. In Acts 8, there was a sorcerer named Simon. He thought he was some great one until he saw the great power of God through Philip. And then he even tried to buy God's power from the disciples. A difference between God's men and the devil's men is that God's men want God to get the glory. And the devil's men want the glory for themselves. But worldliness ruins Christians. The Bible has nothing good to say about the world. First John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have something living in you, if you're born again, that is more powerful than anything in the entire universe. Galatians 1, 3, and 4 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. The Bible calls this a present evil world and we need to come out of the world. 1 John two fifteen through 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the father, father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever.